So I'm really honored to be introducing Jennifer Cole uh, for this plenary lecture. And um, uh, Jennifer graduated uh, from MIT uh, with a dissertation on phonological structure. Uh, she's currently a professor of linguistics at Northwestern University. Uh, Jennifer's work is uh, on what uh, Dwight Bollinger called the glue of language, uh, those forces that link uh, many different parts of linguistic expression into one whole, centered on prosody. Uh, her work is um, uh, evidence that, uh, I think of it as evidence that uh, language is not just uh, made up of these separate aspects with these very thin interfaces between them, but uh, uh, these different aspects interact with each other in extremely uh, deep ways. Uh, and her work uh, on the relationship between phonetics and phonology and phonology and morphology is great evidence for these, uh, uh, for these deep interactions between the different parts of language. Um, again, through prosody, which brings uh, aspects of language from the context of utterance uh, to pragmatics, syntactic phrasing, uh, the phonological structure, as well as the extremely rich uh, um, uh, phonetic expression of this phonological structure. Uh, and as a person who also studies uh, phonetic variation and phonetic detail, I'm always amazed when I go through papers by Jennifer and her collaborators uh, as to the, the the richness of phonetic detail uh, and variety, um, and it's I think very few people have delved into the structure of this variation to the level that she has and her collaborators have. Um, uh, one of the other aspects that I'd like to highlight of Jennifer's research is that even though she's one of the major voices within the laboratory phonology. Uh, enterprise within uh, uh, the study of phonological structure, her work uh, has not only developed uh, and uh, innovated several experimental paradigms for the laboratory study, but she also goes outside of the laboratory to study speech that was not explicitly elicited for the purpose of study. And when one goes into uh, this kind of variation of non-read speech, uh, she has found really interesting uh, um, evidence for this, um, uh, again, these deep relations between different aspects of language that we don't usually study in detail together, especially how context and uh, syntactic, pragmatic, disc uh, discourse level uh, aspects interact with phonetic detail. Um, uh, Jennifer has published quite widely um, in uh, a variety of different journals. Uh, she has also done a great deal of service to the field. She has been editor uh, of Laboratory Phonology. She has also been associate editor at Language and associate editor at Linguistic Inquiry. Uh, she has um, uh, mentored over 26 students, uh, me being one of them, and uh, Jennifer has a style of mentorship that is, I think, very, very special that now as I interact with students, I try to recapture, uh, always with failure, but I keep trying, uh, in which, uh, and as a, as a dynamical systems theorist, I like to characterize it as really getting the student to develop their own natural dynamic and to just sort of channel that natural dynamic uh, into getting the student to be really as creative as they possibly can. And it's a very special uh, uh, quality and uh, type of mentorship that is um, that I think is, is um, uh, has helped me and I think uh, all of her students uh, develop their own careers. So uh, I would like to introduce Jennifer, and uh, she will be talking about information-based approach to explaining variation intonation. Um, thank you, Khalil, for that um, warm welcome. Um, it's uh, he, he left out, uh, for me, the most important aspect of my experience in linguistics, and that's it's tremendously fun uh, because of uh, students and because of colleagues. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, I need my clicker. And uh, 
I'll hope not to wander too far away from the microphone. Wave at me if you can't hear me. Okay. Uh, so in a spoken utterance, uh, typically, one or more words will stand out as prominent. And prominence is one dimension of prosody, the other dimension being phrasing and the marking of boundaries. In my talk I'm go- today, I'm going to be focusing on prominence. Uh, so let's, uh, let's hear, let's listen to an example. Um, so on the screen is a text from an utterance, uh, taken from the Buckeye Corpus. This is, uh, conversational spontaneous speech. And above it is a pitch, uh, track with, uh, some of the words, uh, superimposed showing where the pitch goes up and down. And, uh, if, when we listen to this in just a moment, um, you can listen for where you hear prominence, which words you hear as prominent, uh, and maybe you'll hear prominence on the words that are uh, uh, superimposed on the pitch track, or maybe you'll hear them somewhere else. Okay, please play. Not not happening. I think the main thing that affects me now and since I've been home Okay, so that's illustrative of the kind of speech materials that I've spent a long time investigating. And some of the questions um, that we might ask about prominence with materials like this are, well, within a phrase, which words are going to be prominent? And uh, what type of pitch contour? And more broadly, what other acoustic parameters are involved in the expression of prominence? So we know from prior research that there are at least two factors that determine prominence uh, structure. One relates to structure and the other one relates to information. Let's see how these uh, factors uh, work in English as an example. So in English, phrasal stress is a structural determinant of prominence in a neutral discourse context, and I'll say more in just a moment about what that means. Um, phrasal stress is assigned to the rightmost stressable word, which we call the nucleus. Uh, So in this simple example sentence, poodle is the rightmost stressable word, and that's the word that will receive the phrasal stress. So I bought a poodle. (laughs) Phrasal stress isn't always on the rightmost stressable word in English. It's mobile, and that's because phrasal stress, in addition to having this structural um, determinant, uh, also relates to information. Phrasal stress marks information that's new to the discourse. And a phrase final word that's given because it's been mentioned or uh, or its referent is active in the discourse uh, is not marked for phrasal stress. So in this extended example, the rightmost stressable word is poodle in red. But because it's been mentioned in the discourse, actually in the same sentence, uh, phrasal stress will not occur on that word, but instead will be retracted to an earlier word. So this sentence would be read, I bought a poodle because I've always wanted a poodle. And it would sound weird for an English speaker to have phrasal stress on the on the second instance of poodle. I bought a poodle because I've always wanted a poodle. Right. Sounds weird. <clears throat> now, phrasal stress may also be avoided on a final word that is lexically or semantically accessible based on the discourse context. So in this Example, very similar to the one that I just showed you, the right most stressable word is dog, which has not been mentioned in this tiny little discourse, but it's semantically accessible from prior mention of poodle. And so in this sentence, as in the last example, the phrasal stress will be retracted onto an earlier word. I bought a poodle because I've always wanted a dog. Again, it sounds odd to say I bought a poodle because I've always wanted a dog. In fact, that invites the implicature that the poodles aren't dogs, which is weird. Okay. So um, I've already uh, indicated how structure and information are are, are both determinants of the location of phrasal stress as a a kind of prominence. But information comes uh, to play in another uh, way, and that is that phrasal stress licenses pitch accent. And different kinds of accents can be used according to the information status of a word and its focus status uh, rel- relative to salient semantic alternatives. And it's been proposed for English that a word that has phrasal stress and which introduces new information to the discourse will get a pitch accent uh, that's realized with a gently rising pitch. So this is uh, represented with an H star um, feature in a Toby annotation. Whereas a word with phrasal stress that is contrastively focused uh, will be realized with a steeply rising um, 
pitch contour uh, annotated with an L plus H star pitch accent, low to high tone pitch accent in the Toby notation. And other tonal specifications have been proposed for other um, types of information structure conditions. So let's put this, uh, oh, and in this, in this proposal then, pitch accents are functioning as pragmatic morphemes. The type of pitch accent is signaling the information structure condition of that word. Let's put this together and see how it works with a, another example from English. So consider this sentence, Terry phoned the reporter. So here the word reporter is in the position for phrasal stress. It's the right most stressable word. And in the right discourse context, this word may introduce new information. So, for example, as an answer to the story, as an answer to the question, how was the story leaked? Terry phoned the reporter. Reporter is new information and it can uh, license then this high pitch accent. The same sentence in a different discourse context uh, may receive a different pitch accent. So as an answer to the question, did Terry phone the police? No, Terry phoned the reporter. Okay, now reporter has is contrastively focused, um, and so it will receive a L plus H star, a different pitch accent. This, con this uh, focus contrast marking uh, pitch accent, L plus H star, is not restricted to the rightmost word in a sentence, any word in a sentence can in principle be focused, and this is one of the hallmarks of English and also German intonation. So in a different discourse context, our same sentence uh, will could have contrastive focus on the subject. So did Rita leak the story? Terry phoned the reporter. And then that case, Terry is the uh, going to be the word receiving the, um, the L plus H star pitch accent. Okay, so the rest of my talk is divided into two parts. In the first part, I would like to uh, tell you about some empirical investigations that look at the relationship between prominence, pitch accents, and information structure. And in the second part, which is shorter, I'd like to introduce a proposal that I think can make sense of, of some of the messy findings that come about in the first part. So here we go. I'm going to begin to, by telling you about uh, a, an experiment in my lab on prosodic expression of information structure in English and go on to looking at a bunch of other works, looking at prosodic expression of information structure in other languages. And then we'll pause and talk a bit about a structural bias regarding the alignment of prosodic and informational prominence before we go on to this part two. So in an experiment recently done in my lab with uh, Eleanor Shadroff, uh, who presented, by the way, uh, this uh, results from this experiment yesterday. If you were in that session, you get another tour, quicker tour through this uh, these empirical findings today. So we were looking at the prosodic encoding of information structure in English, American English, through a production study, where we were, uh, our materials were little stories, micro stories that consisted only of three sentences. And the word that we're interested in uh, is the last word of the last sentence. It's the word robbery in boldface and red on the slide. And we want to know how do speakers, uh, what, what is the prosodic expression of this word in relation to its information structure condition? The information structure condition of the word is established uh, earlier in the story, and in particular in the second sentence of the story. So the first sentence sets the stage for the story. Last night I attended a neighborhood meeting. The second sentence sentence sets up the critical information structure condition. Earlier that day, my neighbor witnessed a robbery. The third sentence is our target sentence with our critical word being at the end. My landlord logged the robbery. So here robbery is given because it's been explicitly mentioned in the preceding sentence. Now we have other versions of this story which are the same in the first and third sentence but differ in the, in the second sentence uh, uh, giving us different information structure conditions for our critical word. So here the second sentence reads, several community members reported on recent crimes. Crimes is semantically related to robbery, so robbery becomes accessible in this discourse context. In uh, yet another uh, version of the story, the second sentence introduces no words which are semantically related to our critical word, and so the critical word is discourse new. And then finally, in the uh, fourth version of the story, the second sentence introduces a semantic alternative to the critical word, rendering this word uh, with contrastive focus. So we had 20 unique stories. A participant would would, would uh, receive each story only in one information structure condition, and the, the conditions, uh, the pairing of condition and story was counterbalanced across participants. 
The stories were read aloud in a neutral and a lively speaking style. The lively speaking style was our it was our desperate hope that we would get a variety of prosodic expression. Uh, and we had 32 participants. And in case you're wondering, you know, can you really elicit this kind of prosody in the lab? Uh, because that was our concern, too. I thought I would play for you some of the just randomly chosen examples of productions that illustrate both the accessible and as both the neutral and lively speaking style and also three of the four different um, information structure conditions. So you're going to hear these sentences one after the other in just a moment. Um, and the, the remember that the critical word that we're interested in is the last one. It's bold faced and underlined in the uh, written examples. So now, please just play all three in succession. Our mother sang the melody. My landlord loved a robbery. The mermaid smelled the lavender. Uh, so a very interesting uh, finding, although really not that surprising, is the prevalence of creaky voice in these productions, um, which if you're interested in creaky voice, we're happy to talk to you about that at great length, uh, but I'm not going to say a lot more about it uh, right now. So our predictions for this study were that um, we would get different kinds of pitch accents uh, used depending on the information structure condition. Uh, and in particular, with, if a, when our critical word was contrastively focused or new to the discourse, we would expect to see either a high pitch accent or a rising pitch accent. Whereas when, if the critical word was accessible from the prior context or discourse given, we would expect to have a low pitch accent, maybe uh, expressed through creaky voice or perhaps an unaccented word. Now there are um, different kinds of pitch accents being mixed together in these two broad category distinctions that we're making. Um, and uh, initially we had hoped to make more fine grained distinctions in our labeling of the data, but um, we couldn't support, rely, we couldn't obtain a reliable distinctions beyond this coarse two-way distinction. So we went with this. Uh, we have acoustic measurements to help us suss out any um, more fine-grained distinctions within, within these two categories. So our predictions, uh, additional predictions concerning the difference between lively and neutral speaking style, first of all, we didn't expect that to have, and we didn't predict that to have any effect on the type of pitch accent that was produced under the hypothesis that pitch accents are encoding information structure. And in information structure conditions didn't vary between the neutral and the lively speaking style. On the other hand, we did expect the affect condition to be manifest in differences in acoustic prominence, basically enhanced acoustic prominence under lively speaking conditions is what we were expecting. So we have our recordings and we built regression models to test the effects of information structure and affect, the neutral or lively uh, distinction, as predictors of the type of pitch accent, again with a distinction between the high rising pitch accents on one hand or low uh, creaky voice or unaccented uh, on the other. And we also uh, built regression models to look at uh, the, the effects of these uh, factors, information structure and affect on creaky voice production, the duration of our critical word and the uh, intensity as, as the acoustic correlate of loudness. Uh, and these are the results that we obtained. Um, so here I'm showing you um, uh, two bar graphs. The one on the left is for the productions under neutral affect. The one on the right is for productions under lively affect. And on the y-axis, we have the four different types of information structure conditions that we were looking at. And the type of pitch accent that we uh, observed is coded in colors, a darker color for the high rising pitch accent and the lighter color for the low or unaccented um, productions. And what you can notice, first of all, is that the majority of the target words were coded as low or unaccented. Nonetheless, uh, but, but, but we did find both, both types of pitch accent, the high and the low, occurring in every one of the four information structure categories. This should be a little bit surprising to you. It was a little bit surprising to us. Um, nonetheless, we do find some differences. So the high rising uh, pitch accent is significantly less likely on words that were given, more likely on words that were new, and more likely on words that were contrastive. And the high rising pitch accent was a lot more likely in lively speech. And this effect, the liveliness effect, was larger than the effect of the information structure conditions. Uh, we also saw an effect of information structure on the production of creaky voice, uh, and this is coding words that were, uh, that had creaky voice in them anywhere and words that had no creaky voice or modal voicing. 
uh, and you can see that most of the words had creaky voicing. Um, but nonetheless, creaky voice was less likely on words that were new and more likely on words that were given. And also, but this is not shown on the graph, uh, the creaky voice was less likely in the lively speaking style and much, much more likely in the neutral speaking style. And we had more occurrences of fully pervasive creaky voice on words that produced in the neutral speaking style, which were also discourse given. Okay, looking at some of the other acoustic correlates of prominence, we found that uh, the duration of the of the word, our duration measure, was shorter for words that were given and lively, uh, longer for words produced in the lively style. The intensity measure showed that words were quieter in the given condition. They were louder a little bit in the contra uh, contrastive focus condition and louder uh, in the lively speaking style. And again, the effect of lively speaking style was greater than the effect of information structure. So what we've seen, just to sum up quickly, is that the prosodic encoding of information structure is, on the one hand, probabilistic, and on the other hand, grady, uh, gradient in its acoustic expression. So quite a bit of variation here. I said a moment ago we were surprised, but not really. If we're being really honest, we've actually seen results like this before. Uh, in our own work and in work of other people. In fact, there's mounting evidence for a probabilistic many-to-many -many association between pitch accents and information structure from studies looking at red speech and from studies looking at uh, unscripted speech from speech corpora. I'm going to highlight just a couple of these studies just to give you a flavor of the kind of findings that have been reported. So here's a study uh, on German uh, from... Uh, Doris Muke and Martin Greis, and they were looking at asking this very question about prosodic and conic of information structure in German with very short sentences of the sort, Melanie wants to meet Dr. Bobber, but in German. Uh, and these sentences were elicited under different discourse prompts that were presented textually with a question, like, does Norbert want to meet Dr. Bobber? In this particular example, the critical word is Dr. Bobber in the position for nuclear, uh, for phrasal stress. In this particular example, example, Dr. Bobber is given because it was mentioned in the prompting question. With the, using different prompting questions, they were able to elicit this same sentence under uh, broad focus, narrow focus, and contrastive focus. So they're looking at what kind of pitch accents do German speakers produce under this, this critical word under the different information structure conditions, very much like the experiment that I shared with you a moment ago on English. They coded their data for three different kinds of pitch accents, and then they looked at the distribution of those accents for words in the four information structure categories. And what they found is that the accent type varies across information structure categories, but in a way that suggests a prominence hierarchy so that the more prominent kind of pitch accent, which would be the L plus H star, the steeply rising pitch accent, is more common in the more uh, informative kind of uh, information structure condition, the contrastive focus. And it's, de it's less common under narrow focus, even less common under broad focus. And they had no occurrences of accented words in the given condition. Looking at a different study, this is some data from a, a study I did with Su Yun Im and Stefan Baumann. We looked at the relationship between uh, prominence and information structure in spontaneous speech from a TED talk. So this is speech from one speaker, but it's an entire, uh, the entire uh, speech, an entire intact narrative. And we um, looked at all of the content words in this narrative. And we uh, assigned each content word uh, uh, a status, an information status. I'm showing you here just the information status labels for the referential givenness. Uh, and then we have a, a label that I haven't introduced before, which was for na proper names. And then we had words that were new, given, and accessible. And we coded the data with uh, different pitch accent labels according to the TOBI standard. And that's represented by different colors of the bars. And what you should just see is that each of these bars is very colorful in the, on the gray scale. So all the different kinds of pitch accents are occurring in all of the different kinds of information structure conditions in this corpus. Now, these prior studies also show evidence of gradient effects of information structure on acoustic prosodic measures. Uh, the number of studies provide uh, robust evidence of this for English. And there's an interesting uh, quote from Sasha Calhoun's 2012 paper on Australian English where she says, the more phonetically prominent an accent, 
the more likely a contrastive interpretation. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share with you some really interesting data from a paper by Iris Uyang and Elsie Kaiser. They were looking at an investigation, uh, individual speaker differences in the prosodic encoding of informativity. And what they found was that many speakers will use the same pitch accent pattern in different focus conditions, but they'll have gradient acoustic distinctions. And I've copied and pasted in a little uh, snippet of the figure from their paper that shows um, uh, the F0 contour over the word balls taken from the sentence, they got balls at the sports store, where balls is either uh, has corrective focus or new information focus or it's part of a broad focus and that those differences are represented by different colors on the F0 contours. And what we can see is that, uh, for this, uh, average, for these, for this particular speaker whose, um, productions are shown in average here, um, there's the same type of pitch accent is used, the same shape of pitch contour, but the focus conditions are differentiated by the scaling of this contour. Other examples uh, we can find from German, again, two different studies uh, asking this question on German, uh, and I have a quote from a, a recent study by Stefan Baumann and Jane Mertens where they say that the newer the referent, the wider the F0 range and the steeper the rise. Uh, and we can see an example of this graphed nicely from the German study by Muke and Grice, which I introduced a few moments ago, uh, where they had this, this uh, simple sentences like Melanie wants to meet Dr. Bobber, and they took uh, duration uh, they took duration measurements from the syllable and also from the whole word of their critical uh, word, and showed that the duration increases uh, gradiently as you go from the given condition to broad focus to narrow focus and contrastive. And the three lines on this plot from their paper are representing duration measurements from three different vowels for three different critical words, but the pattern is the same each each time. Now, the gradient acoustic effects of information structure are not a particular quirk of English and German, and they occur also in languages that lack an inventory of tonally diverse pitch accents, and therefore languages that can't use pitch accent types to distinguish information structure, languages like Hindi-Urdu. And here's been a number of studies looking at the pro uh, prosodic expression of information structure in Hindi or Urdu. Um, so here's an example from uh, Vandana Puri's uh, University of Illinois thesis in 2013. Um, and I need to tell you just a little bit about uh, Hindi intonation. So Hindi exhibits a fixed intonational melody, which is a rising pitch. It's assigned to every accentual phrase, where an accentual phrase is a content word and following function words. So in this example sentence, which has, is translated, Kalam made a picture outside for puja. There are four accentual phrases, and we can see, you can see from the pitch contour, uh, that there are four rise fall patterns. Now, uh, Puri, in her thesis, did a, a production study with 30 speakers of Hindi where she tested the effects of information structure on the object in SOV sentences. Uh, where the object was either, uh, had narrow focus, it was the answer to a question, or it had broad focus, or it was given because it had been explicitly mentioned. And she took, um, acoustic measurements of duration, intensity, and F0 range from the object, and she found that, um, among these three measurements, there's a three-way distinction, uh, for these three information structure conditions. Um, you get more prosodic enhancement under the uh, narrow focus conditions than compared to the broad focus compared to the given condition. Now, gradient acoustic effects of information structure are also observed in languages that primarily or often use syntax to signal focus, languages like Hungarian, Russian, or Jamunjang. This is a, a short, uh, just a few examples from a long list. <clears throat> a very I recently uh, learned about this very interesting pattern in Jamanjung from a paper by uh, a, a study by Simard and Belkadi. Jamanjung is an Australian Aboriginal language with non-configurational syntax and a topic comment word order. <clears throat> and uh, Simard and Belkadi looked at uh, unscripted story narrations from three speakers with about 400 intonational units. <clears throat> and what they found was that uh, for, for words in the topic position, when they were new information, they had higher mean F0 and wider F0 excursions. For words that were a topic, words in the topic position that were contrastively focused, they had even wider F0 excursions. And they did a very interesting further 
<clears throat> uh, they took an interesting further step in their study and they looked at the gradient accessibility of the discourse referent by measuring how far it was from the word under, uh, under investigation. And they found even finer distinctions for the mean F0 of the target word based on the gradient accessibility of the discourse referent, basically how distant it was. Uh, but it was an interesting pattern. The most distant uh, discourse referent had the highest acoustic prominence, and they interpreted that as a re- discourse reactivation of that word. It was even more prominent than a, a word that had new information, uh, and the least prominent were words that had just recently been mentioned. So those were the truly given words. Uh, a somewhat different, but findings, but in the same uh, in the same ballpark, came from a study that I did with uh, Tatiana Luchkina on Russian. Um, and this was a production study with 15 speakers reading passages from two published texts. So they were reading aloud. One text was a folk story. Uh, so it was written for an oral, uh, oral style of speaking. The other was a nonfiction text. And we were looking for the effects of information structure on uh, measures of duration, F0 range, and intensity under three different um, types of, inf- of information structure, given, new, and accessible. The findings were uh, somewhat surprising because we found that words that were discourse given had the highest profile in their duration and F0 range. Um, This uh, finding, we eventually came to understand that this was actually reflecting a word order effect because these uh, words that were given were most frequently produced in non-canonical fronted positions in sentence structure. Uh, Russian has much more flexibility in sentence structure than does English or German, and uh, word order is uh, very much related to information structure conditions in, ger- in, in Russian. The next two slides have the graphs that show this word order interaction with information structure, and I'm just going to click past them. We don't probably have time to parse out, but if you're interested, I'll be happy to talk about those particular findings later. Okay, so recapping. The empirical evidence that I've hustled through uh, has uh, shown that uh, with regarding the relationship between pitch accents and information structure, we see a probabilistic many-to-many mapping, and we also see gradient variation of acoustic prominence along an informativity scale or parts of an informativity scale, with the caveat being that given words may not always be the least uh, the least prominent. Okay, so we could stop here and say, all right, so that's it. There's a probabilistic many-to-many mapping with lots of acoustic variation, but I'm not satisfied with that. I would like to actually just figure out what theory predicts this uh, curious assemblage of empirical findings. But before we can, I can go on to my proposal, I need to make a third observation, and that has to do with a, a structural bias. So it's commonly observed that languages have um, designated positions for high information content. Uh, In English, this position is uh, described as being at the end of the sentence, so this is where new information should occur under given new sequencing or theme ream sentence structure. I'm going to refer to this position uh, in the next few slides as the high information content position. The actual position can vary from language to language, though bear that in mind. So in English, this high information content position coincides with the position for phrasal stress, a position of structural prominence, and the position that licenses a pitch accent. So a word that occurs in this position in English, so sentence finally, it's a stressed word, it's got the structural, the phrasal prominence, and a pitch accent, it's multiply prominent. It has not only a structural prominence phonetically expressed, but it has an inherent informational prominence by virtue of its position in sentence structure. Now, we have some evidence for this sort of inherent prominence of words in this position from a a study uh, that uh, I have recently done with a number of colleagues, some of whom are in this room, um, looking at prominence perception uh, in English, French, and Spanish. And what we find is that words in this high information content position are more likely to be perceived by, by naive listeners as being prominent, independent of their acoustic and lexical properties. This is true for all of these three languages. On the other hand, other studies show that uh, a word that's not in that designated position, so a pre-nuclear prominence, is less related to information structure compared to words in the nuclear position. So those words might be prominent, but they just seem to have less to do with information structure. 
What seems to matter is the relative prominence between words in the nuclear and the pre-nuclear positions, and that seems to be the critical factor for uh, interpreting information structure. So this structural bias uh, is not a quirk of English or German. It, we can, in fact, see this in other languages as well, and we can see it in Hindi. So in Hindi, the canonical word order is subject, object, verb, and the position for high information content words is the pre-verbal position or the object position. And uh, we'll remind you that um, in Hindi, we get prosodic encoding of focus manifesting in a slightly expanded F0 range for that uh, rising uh, contour on the accentual phrase. Now, uh, Caroline Ferry and her colleagues did a study looking at the prosodic expression of focus in Hindi in words with an SOV word order. And they, uh, they looked at uh, what happens when the subject is focused, what happens when the object is focused, what happens when there's just broad focus on the whole, on the whole sentence. And this graph is from their paper and it shows the average F0 contours, uh, over subjects and, and sentences for the three different focus conditions. And the uh, F0 contour in red is showing uh, what happens when the subject is, is focused. And in that case, the subject is in C2. It's in the canonical order, but it's not in the position for uh, high information content. And we get prosodic marking of focus, uh, elevated uh, an expanded F0 range on the subject and damped F0 excursions on the object. On the other hand, when it's the object that's focused with this same sentence order, um, the uh, acoustic effects here in F0 are minimal and, in fact, sometimes not measurable at all. Um, this is the position for high information content. So we see a structural bias in terms of the prosodic expression of information structure depending on whether the word is in that designated position or not. Uh, there's a second way in which the structural bias manifests, and that has to do with prosodically driven word order. So non-canonical word order can be used in some languages, maybe all, uh, to locate a word that has a marked focus, a narrow or contrastive focus, in a position where it's going to receive a default prosodic prominence. It's going to be moved to that position of high information content. So in Hindi, as I've already mentioned, the canonical word order is SOV, and you can force people to produce focus on the subject or the object. You can force those productions, but... Left to their own instincts, a Hindi speaker would probably prefer to do an OSV word order when the subject is focused, because that puts the subject in the position, uh, which is the preferred position for high information content. And that's, in fact, been found uh, in the study, uh, uh, another element of the study that I cited from Ferry, Pandi, and Kentner. Uh, other examples from other languages, so Spanish has a canonical word order, SOSVO, and in Spanish, uh, it's the rightmost word in the sentence that is the uh, uh, nuclear, bears the phrasal stress, and that's the d designated high information content position. And in Spanish, focus words move to phrase final position, and this is the way of expressing focus. In Samoan, which is a VSO language, the position uh, for high information content is at the beginning of the sentence, and focus words move to that position as well. In French, the canonical word order is SVO, and uh, it's famously known for having final prominence, phrase final prominence. Uh, French uses cleft constructions, uh, uh, not exclusively, but very often to position a focused word in phrase final position. And in Russian, we get a variety of word orders conditioned by information structure, but generally putting um, uh, reactivated topics at the beginning of the sentence, um, putting um, new information also postponed to the end of the sentence, and each having its distinct prosodic signature. Okay, so recapping again, we've seen probabilistic many-to-many -many mappings between pitch accents and information structure. We've seen gradient variation of acoustic prominence along an informativity scale, and now we've seen a structural bias manifest in uh, the finding that positions where structural and informational prominence align have inherent prominence, and in those positions, prosodic marking of informativity can be minimal. We also see non-canonical word order is used in some languages to locate informative words in positions of prosodic prominence. These findings altogether aren't predicted at all by our existing theories of the interface between prosody and information structure, so we need to take another look. And that's the remaining part of my talk, then I'll try to uh, introduce a proposal that I think works. We'll talk about it, predictability and informativity. Mention conventionalization, and I'm going to talk about subjectivity on the part of the speaker. So 
I started out this talk with a focus on prominence and information structure, and now I want to suggest that we need to step back from that because information structure on its own both over and under determines variation in prosodic prominence. This is a weak relationship. What's really going on, I think, has more to do with predictability uh, as a broader notion than information structure. So we know from the work of many other people uh, that predictability of a word and its referent influences linguistic expression at the lexical, syntactic, phonological, and phonetic levels. We have uh, very influential proposals uh, by Levy and Jaeger on the uniform information density hypothesis or by Eilat and Turk on the smooth signal redundancy hypothesis, which spell out this, the effects of predictability on, uh, on, on the production. Uh, so there are a lot of factors that contribute to predictability. Information structure is one of them, both referential and lexical givenness and focus, but it's not the whole story. The syntactic and semantic context of a, of a word also contributes to its predictability, both in terms of measurements of frequency, also just the syntactic uh, predictability of the syntactic frame uh, or selectional uh, restrictions. So I think what we can say is that prosodic expression is inversely related to predictability. Less predictable words are prosodically enhanced, while more predictable words are prosodically reduced. And I'm not the first person to say that. That's what Eilid and Turk say in their uh, influential paper from 2004. And so what this allows us then to capture the observed gradient covariation of predictability and pitch accent. It's not the case that a given pitch accent encodes a particular information structure condition, but rather there's a hierarchy of information structure ranging from less predictable to more predictable and a hierarchy of prominence over different types of pitch accents. And uh, within an utterance, as you have words the relative informativity of a word, relative predictability of a word, should correlate with its relative prominence of its pitch accents. So this is a syntagmatic relation within an utterance. But even this isn't quite right. It's not always the case that less predictable words are prosodically enhanced. And what we probably need to say is that less predictable words are prosodically marked to stand out relative to preceding context. So that a, a prosodic distinction will be more for words that are less predictable and less for words that are more predictable. But uh, listeners don't always perceive an F0, but, but this, I want to cite this really nice paper from Kakorus and Johannes, who show that listeners perceive an F0 contour that is less frequent or locally unexpected as prominent, independent of its actual shape as a rising or falling pitch contour. And then in, in work I've already mentioned to you, done uh, with Su Young Kim uh, in my lab, we looked at, uh, we, we can see that in the context of a speaker who has globally enriched prosody, a loud, very dynamic speaker, like me right now, waving my hands, uh, informativity can be marked by locally dampened prosody. Just going softer with lower pitch is a good way to mark focus if you're overall shouting and waving your hands. Okay, so, uh, well, this is a nice story. Prominence relates to predictability, but it doesn't get us all the way through the empirical findings that I've shared with you. In particular, it doesn't really help us yet understand the structural bias. And uh, for this, I think we need to step away from unpredictability and look at an even broader concept, which I'm here calling informativity, but I'm very open to suggestions for using different terminology. So I think what we can say is that predictability relates to informativity. Less predictable words convey more information. And sentence structure is partly organized around informativity by designating positions for high information content. This is the familiar given before new word order. Or languages uh, may use a topic comment order or use special constructions like clefs in order to put uh, uh, designate positions for uh, information content. And so here's, I think, what we can say that's consistent with the empirical findings. Prosodic expression varies with informativity. We could stop right here. This is, I think, the whole story, but I've got a few more slides. So just to kind of spell out, I think, how this proposal works, an informative or therefore less predictable word uh, in a designated high information content position has less need for prosodic enhancement to signal its information content because it's already in the position. And from this, we observe our, I think this helps us understand the structural bias that we've observed. 
In a designated high information content position, prosodic marking of informativity can be minimal. And in examples from our study where we were looking at the nuclear accent and its relation to information structure, we found that there were a lot of different pitch accents possible, no matter what the information structure condition was. And I think this can be explained by the fact that that position was enough to designate the information uh, condition. So what about an informative word that's not in that lucky position? Well, in that case, in a language like English, as well as German, prosodic boosting is possible. So here's our example with Terry phoning the reporter. In this sentence, offered as an answer to the question, how was the story leaked? Terry is also new information and important. And so it can be prosodically boosted. It's not in that designated position, but it can receive a pitch accent as a way of uh, underscoring its contribution to the discourse uh, information. Of course, reporter also is uh, introducing information, and it can also get a pitch accent. And in this case, I've designated two equal pitch accents, so the prominence between the pre-nuclear and the nuclear elements are equal. And that's felicitous. That's fine for English. However, prosodic boosting of that earlier word in the sentence can potentially result in a misalignment of prosodic and informational prominence. This doesn't always work out very well. So if we boost the uh, pitch accent on Terry and give it like an L plus H star, but we don't boost the pitch accent on reporter to the same degree, we get an imbalance where the pre-nuclear pitch accent has greater prominence than the nuclear one. And this is generally not felicitous in English. Unless a greater prominence on the non-final word is appropriate if, in fact, that word is more informative. Uh, than the word in the designated high information content position. So if the, if the question was, did Rita leak the story? And the answer is, Terry phoned the reporter, then Terry might be the most important word, in which case, giving that whopping L plus H star pitch accent to Terry is fine. Uh, in the, in this configuration in English, this has been conventionalized to convey contrastive or corrective focus on a non-final word. Now, in this case, post-focal words are typically unaccented, but they actually don't have to be and unaccenting further strengthens the alignment of prosodic and informational prominence. Now, as an alternative to prosodic boosting for words that are not in the designated position, syntax uh, steps in and gives another uh, another way to align prosodic and informational prominence. And from this, we see the second aspect of the structural bias. Non-canonical word order can be used to locate an informative word in a position of prosodic prominence where additional prosodic enhancement may or may not occur. Okay, so I've said now that informativity relates to prosody, to prominence in particular, and so if we could know for certain all of the factors that contribute to the informativity index of a word, we should be able to compute it and predict with high accuracy the actual prosodic expression of a word in a particular discourse context. But my work with corpus materials shows there's a tremendous amount of speaker variability. Uh, and the same speaker doesn't always say the same thing the same way twice, much less two different speakers. And so we have to recognize that when the speaker has a message, an intended message to communicate, there are a number of linguistic resources available to that speaker for how to package how to package that that message. The speaker has to choose which words to lexicalize and whether to use pronouns or content words, what kind of sentence structure to use, a canonical one or a specialized sentence structure, and then finally, what kind of prosodic expression to lay down. So there are a lot of uh, places where the speaker can make choices leading to different outcomes in the prosodic expression of that sentence. So my final comment here is that informativity is, in fact, subjective on the part of the speaker. A speaker can strategically downgrade informativity with damped prosody when assuming that information is in the common ground shared with the listener. A speaker can also upgrade informativity with enhanced prosody as a strategy to draw the listener's attention. I'm trying to do that now with lots of pitch accents. Okay, and this is what we found in our lively speech productions. Now, interestingly... Listeners aren't confused by these effects, and they calibrate their perception of prominence according to the speaker's style. So these prosodic effects introduce variability in prosodic expression that's unrelated to information structure, but which is significant for understanding the social and communicative goals of the speaker. And so we who study prosody should really look at prosody in relation to social and communicative context. So to recap empirical findings, I've shown you that uh, 
Uh, there's a probabilistic many-to-many -many mapping between pitch accent types and information structure in languages like English and German. That there is gradient variation of acoustic prominence along an informativity scale and that there are some serious structural biases going on such that prosodic expression depends on information structure and sentence structure. So in conclusion, then, my findings are that uh, I, I would argue that much of the variation in pitch accent assignment can be understood better as variation in phrase level prominence. Prominence tracks informativity. Less predictable words are more informative, and they have greater overall acoustic prominence. And this is a phonetic effect, not a phonological effect, I would argue. This calls to question the status of pitch accents as categorical elements, and I've been thinking a lot about this lately, but I'm not going to say anything about it in this talk, so you'll have to catch me afterwards to ask what I think about pitch accents as phonological categories. Uh, and further, though, the informativity of a word is determined in part by context, but also by the speaker's communicative goals and intentions. And prosodic encoding of information structure in particular can be overridden by the speaker with interpretive consequences. And finally, uh, prosodic prominence aligns with informational prominence in syntactically determined high information content positions. This results in further variation in prosodic expression in relation to the, the syntactic structure. Okay, now the title of my talk had the word conventionalization in it, and uh, the astute person in the audience might have realized I only said one thing about conventionalization so far. And yet in my mind, this is a big part of the story, so let me try to draw it out. I, my, my, the question that launched this research for me was, do pitch accents encode information structure? And the answer is, mm, only indirectly through locally relative phonetic prominence. But a stable form function association between prosodic expression and, say, information structure could emerge as a conventionalized strategy. Maybe, maybe especially, we can see this in English, in focus mark, corrective focus marking of a word early in the sentence that occurs early in the sentence. And if it's conventionalized to a certain degree, it could generalize to other positions. But I don't think English is there yet. I think the conventionalized prosodic expression of information structure is really limited in English to this early words that are not in the designated position for high information content. So for future research, I think some important questions are, well, how common, looking across languages, how common is it to have the conventionalized pairing of prosodic form and information structure meaning? I haven't found any examples yet of strongly conventionalized pairings of this sort. Uh, and secondly, what types of prosodic features and information structure distinctions get paired together? Uh, we'll leave you on those questions, but I need to thank the, all the people who made this work possible, my postdocs, Timo Rotger and Eleanor Shadroff, the undergraduates in my lab who did the real heavy lifting with our, uh, with our, uh, production study, uh, my collaborators over many years who've, uh, really inspired my thinking, and of course, funding sources. So thank you. I think we have some time for questions. Yes. Sorry. Oh, thank you for the talk. And I think this is fascinating. I'm wondering how your, like, this um, theory frame speaks to the uh, classic prosodic model such as a hat model which have like initial rising declination and final lowering and whether that is a part of your um, structure bias that, that is you, you used here or you treat that as um, psychological where people might normalize them in the perception I'm, I'm just wondering where the position of that Okay, so you're asking a question about the hat uh, pattern, which is a, a sharp rise in, or a rise in pitch at the beginning of a sentence, flat and falling at the end, which is particularly characteristic for British English, but it's, it's also used in American English and in other languages. So I think that that pattern itself speaks to the structural underpinnings um, because you get a rise marking the beginning and then a fall marking the end. Um, how it relates to information structure is, um, I think, 
succumbs to the same story that I'm telling here. The use of that hat pattern is not consistent in any particular information structure condition, but it's more prevalent in some conditions than others, and that varies by language. And then you asked about how listeners perceive these things. I think I am asking, like, well, I think this, let me think. I think this model, I see it as more stable than maybe you consider, but, but that kind of, um, shape also occurs in Mandarin and mm -hmm. other languages. And that has some, as I said, psychological, uh, physiological grounds because of the, like, decline of the, um, I don't know, sub, sub global pressure and stuff. So I think I'm wondering where does those phonetic effects, um, come in, in your, um, in your theory? Because I think you sort of mentioned the, um, the, the structure bias, bias that kind of decide the default intonation for, mm -hmm. like, sentences in the language. Right. And I'm, um, I'm, um, so part of that is saying that this hat model is pre like is predicted by the structure of the language mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. Maybe there are other factors mm -hmm. that speak to that default pattern, mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering what do you think of that? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I guess I would say off the cuff that that uh, that hat pattern as a default pattern could be an example of a conventionalized pattern. I don't know to what extent it pairs that pattern with an information structure condition, but it could be conventionalized with reference to illocutionary force or other other dimensions of meaning or even to non-linguistic meanings of the speaker's affect or communication style. Um, and I think all of that is possible. Yeah. But is that part of your structure bias? Like, uh, Not necessarily. The hat pattern might relate to the structural bias, but wouldn't we wouldn't have to uh, explain it exhaustively only with reference to the. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great talk, and I will try to be brief. Uh, one of the more, one of the most insightful things, uh, many uh, among many that you said, uh, was that less predictable words are prosodically marked to stand out relative to preceding context. And to me, this implies a kind of taking of statistics. Uh, you, uh, you know determining some default so you can determine whether there's damping or enhancement, maybe even taking speaker-specific statistics. So do you agree that listeners must be taking statistics on prosodic patterns as a means of, means of gauging informativity? Um, and if so, what links do you see uh, to making inroads to um, I mean, coming up with an account for that? Absolutely, Laura. And your, your work has uh, actually informed my thinking on that quite a lot, that the uh, immediately preceding uh, speech context is highly informative, and we know from your work that it, it can lead to categorical distinctions in the interpretation of a particular word. Uh, um, but even broader context, just knowing, being familiar with the speaker or knowing that, oh, this person's standing on a stage giving a lecture, so I should probably calibrate my perception of their prosody relative to that. Um, what the kind of the where I would go with this um, uh, with this idea is that if we're trying to characterize the prosodic form of an utterance in a language because we want to investigate it as scientists, um, that we should not do what's conventional in prosodic theory, which is to do a kind of paradigmatic analysis where we say, is this word is this high or low or l plus h star, but we need to be really doing a syntagmatic annotation and uh, You've certainly said that, um, and I'm agreeing with you on that point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, okay, so I have a quick question about the idea that this is probabilistic, which uh, accents occur in which context in some way. Um, in, in particular, I'm a little bit worried about the, the, the premise that what these um, intonational morphemes, as you call them, uh, encode the information structural categories that we've identified. Um, so perhaps some of the problems in saying like, oh, it's probabilistic is a labeling problem on this, on the part of the theoretician. So for example, if you were looking at past tense in English, your ED in English, you'd say, oh, this means past tense. Oh, but you find that sometimes ED doesn't occur in situations that refer to past times, and sometimes you get ED in contexts that are not past time referential. And so it's probabilistic which ones you get in which context, but really it's a problem of what is the meaning of this morpheme that we have called past tense. 
And so I, I just I, I wonder if this is a possible way of reanalyzing what we've been what you've been saying as a many to many mapping problem as that we don't understand what the really core, what the core meaning of these uh, individual pitch accents are. Uh, that's certainly possible that, that our understanding of either the form, the prosodic form, or the information structure meaning is imperfect, and with improved understanding, we might see more system here, more systematicity. But I think <clears throat> given findings from the highly controlled um, experimental studies, such as we've done and have been done in German, where the discourse context is pretty, I mean, it's explicit, and the same discourse context across items and across speakers, we're getting uh, or even within the speaker, we're getting variable prosodic expression for the same discourse. So, and and I, the, my reason for showing examples of that from many different studies was to try to dispel the notion that there's going to be an easy fix to understanding this problem, which doesn't uh, deny the possibility that you suggest, but. Uh, but I think, you know, if we were, even if we were to a achieve a much more sophisticated understanding, that that alone wouldn't explain the variability we find in these experimental settings unless speakers are just not bothering to encode information structure and assigning pitch accents randomly. But that also can't be true because we found there is an ex prosodic expression of information structure in our materials. It's just kind of messy, but it's there. So they are they are factoring in the information structure conditions. Yeah. Um, I really found this really very interesting, and I understand that a lot of the corpora that you work with are uh, only acoustic signal and not video signal with acoustic signal. But I wonder if you uh, could have considered when you have the opportunity, like with a TED Talk, where there's video signal and auditory signal, to consider where the co-speech gestures occur with respect to the prosodic patterns, because I was thinking that the information structure um, messiness, if you knew that the, the person who was speaking was also gesturing along with what they were saying, they the co-speech gestures may be offloading some of the work that the prosodic um, pitch accents are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent um, suggestion. Um, I have, in fact, uh, collected a corpus, an audio-visual uh, corpus of spontaneous um, task-oriented speech with uh, Suyun Im, who's here, and we uh, um, did a gesture annotation, uh, but we haven't analyzed yet. <laughs> We're still busy working out the prosody on on that on those materials, but we, we have the intention of also analyzing the gesture. And as you're correct to point out that for the TED Talk, uh, if we undertake the gestural annotation, <laughs> we would have the similar opportunity. And I, I would love to hear from anybody who's come up with a um, quick quicker way of doing gestural annotation. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Jason. Okay. Um, so we were kind of invited to ask you about the phonological status of pitch accents. And so uh, my question is related to that. So not so much, I think, uh, as I understand it in your proposal, but in the earlier work that you presented um, or the, uh, at the beginning of the talk, uh, you, uh, you grouped um, low plus high star and high star uh, together and low star and down step high star. Uh, and as I understand it, the justification is basically um, informational, the kind of information these uh, tend to mark. Um, so uh, I guess I want to ask, uh, so this, the, the groupings are not so uh, controversial uh, in, in the case of uh, um, high star high and star. low plus high star, because mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of overlap um, mm -hmm. phonetically in their realizations, but also uh, in their perception in tasks like rapid prosody transcription. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a little more co uh, controversial in the case of um, uh, downstep high star and low star. Mm -hmm. So uh, the phonetically mid-tone downstep mm -hmm. high star has been kind of I mean, codified in the Toby um, system that um, you're at least using here is that it's a fundamentally a high target. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if there's uh, other kinds of evidence, like from rapid prosody transcription, that in fact the downstep high star does seem to cluster mm -hmm. uh, with the low target. Um, so uh, two things about that. One, um, 
the downstepped high star can uh, actually is a good example in support of my claim uh, and standing behind Laura Dilley that we really have to be looking at syntagmatic relations because a downstep is only downstep relative to what came before it, and that's what matters. But um, there are reason for uh, collapsing uh, downstep high and low. Really had more to do with the fact that in this in that particular experiment, our critical word was at the end of the story, and there was so much creaky voice that we didn't have enough tokens to feel very confident about making finer grain distinctions. And we weren't able to achieve reliability with our annotators when we tried. So we backed off from that. That was more um, a pragmatic choice, uh, just a logistic choice with respect to that experiment. We're actually running a follow-up experiment uh, where we've, uh, looking at nu nuclear accents, but we've moved it away from the end of the utterance by adding sort of semantically vacuous relative clause after it. Um, and we're hoping to, uh, be able to tease out maybe some more, uh, more pitch distinctions, uh, if they exist in that. So I'm, I'm open to that possibility. Hi. Uh, oh, good. Uh, thank you. I'm really excited to see all this reappraisal of information structure categories happening. Great. I'm, I'm curious if you think there's a role for the following context in these kinds of experiments. I've noticed that, like, especially contrastive topic prosody is much better if you're, uh, if you know that you're going to do something next in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great uh, question. Um, we, I, I have to just confess that I haven't looked at all at following context. Um, we've been very preoccupied with trying to establish whether nuclear accents are the same or different from pre-nuclear accents in English and German and Spanish and French. Um, but we haven't really looked at what the following material does, but it's definitely um, unnecessary, I agree. I, I would take your question as a challenge, though, and I take it. Thanks. Um, do you find um, instances where uh, the there is definitely a prosodic, uh, you know, um, what's the opposite of dampening? A prosodic enhancement. Enhancement um, where in an unexpected place where there is uh, a uh, there is less information structure, and how does this uh, theory account for that sort of Variation that you've uh, I, yeah, I've got a, this long uh, notebook where I mark every time I hear a pitch accent in an unexpected place. Um, um, it happens. Um, a lot of you can get pitch accents on on articles and on prepositions and discourse markers and all kinds of dangly little bits of, of speech. Um, oftentimes, they uh, to me sound like uh, a focus. A focus marking that they're focused. You know, you, it is possible in the right context to want to focus um, a grammatical word, um, and that's what they sound like. But there are other occurrences where it doesn't seem like there's focus going on in the context, based on the context, and yet they still occur. Um, and yeah, so th that's a real phenomenon, and it has not been studied. Right. I mean, it seems like in these studies too that if you find every single possible, like. Even if it's if it's low, but you find every single possible combination of, uh, you know, pitch accent and information structure, um, that that isn't something that this that this really gets at, is it? it, it what what is something it doesn't get at the 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 occur the possible occurrence of prosodic prominence on a word that doesn't really uh, convey information. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not going to, right. So there will be some occurrence, there will be some instances where uh, we're surprised at a pitch accent. Um, yeah, uh, it's messy. I don't know what to say about that yet because I haven't collected all of those and kind of held them up and said what's going on here. Um, it could be uh, that there's a tendency in English to want to put a pitch accent in if there hasn't been one for a long time, and it could right. be that there's an avoidance of accenting, accenting on a content word that really is uh, highly inferable or given, and in which case possibly you could get a pitch accent on some other bit. But I, I'm, I'm just waving my hands here. I don't really know. But I acknowledge that the phenomenon exists. I think it's not very common, but it, it's often enough that it merits study. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, we're, we've been working at Stony Brook on, um, comparing Mandarin speakers, uh, production of contrastive accent in English with native speakers. 
and found that indeed they were quite different, but not in the direction we expected, and that the Mandarin speakers were much more consistent in what we thought of as normal contrastive focus mm -hmm. than the native speakers, which is mm -hmm. entirely consistent with what you found. And we thought you know, one possible explanation is the the creaky voice among mm -hmm. the English speakers, but also that um, the Mandarin speakers have actually been taught this, and so it's conventionalized for mm -hmm. them. Yeah, we we found similar things, and also in our studies on uh, prominence perception that um, English second language speakers of English, uh, so who who are Japanese speakers, uh, are uh, more consistent in hearing prominence on in relation to information structure than English speakers are. Uh, with focus, with regard to focus in particular, we we didn't quite find that, but uh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much.